So here's where we farm. Uh, we are in south central Nebraska, right here, kind of right smack in the middle of the continental 48 states. Uh, this is what we want our fields to look like when we farm. Uh, when we plant our corn, I don't even want to be able to see where the planter went. We don't use row cleaners. Uh, we just kind of slot, uh, drop the seed in and close it up. So this is uh, dry land corn uh, growing in wheat stubble from the previous year that had a cover crop planted into it. And the winter terminated and we planted corn into this. We've been no-tilling for 30 plus years. Uh, we're about two-thirds dry land and a third irrigated. Fairly typical rotation for that area, corn, beans, and some sort of cereal. But since we've kind of started down the soil health trail, we started growing a lot of other things. Now we don't grow these every year, uh, but we've been growing rye and triticale and barley, vetch, sunflowers, buckwheat, different things like that. Partially because we need them for the cover crop business, uh, but also because it makes a really good uh, rotations for us as well. Uh, we started green cover seed in 2009, so we've been kind of fiddling around with cover crops now for 14 years. In 2011, this is all a farm field. Uh, this has all been built since 2011 in response to how fast the whole cover crop market has grown. So when we started in 2009, we moved enough seed uh, out for about 1,000 acres, and this year, uh, 2021, uh, we moved enough seed to cover about a million acres. So that just gives you an indication of how fast the whole soil health movement has grown. So what I want to do here this morning is to try to explain one of the most complex systems in the world, and that's what's going on in this soil. And I want to do that in a little bit of a unique way by comparing it to another complex system, but it's one that we understand better because we live in it every single day, and that's the economy of a country. And so this isn't going to be a talk about economics, dollars and cents, I did this, this, and this, and I made $200 an acre. This is going to be big picture economics, the macroeconomics of what's going on in the soil, because our soils function very much like the economy of a country. And so as I started looking at this and thinking about it, there's these basic principles of, of economics, supply and demand, and currency and capital and all these different things. And as I looked at it closely, I thought, you know what, those same things are going on in a healthy soil system. And so that's what we're going to talk about here this morning, these seven principles of economics and how they apply, how we see them living out, how we see them being proved out in our soil. So, the first thing that we need to kind of understand is that our soil economy, really our ag economy, our livelihoods, it's based on the sun, it's solar energy. As farmers, what we're really doing is we're taking solar energy and we're turning it into something of value that we can sell and make a profit on. And so the three main players within this economy, the soil and the plants, we understand that pretty well because we work with them all the time. But the thing that we often miss, I know we miss it on our farm the most, it's the animals. And I'm not talking here, I'm, I won't be talking a lot about livestock or, or cattle. They are important to the system. I'm not denying that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to be talking about the soil biology, the bacteria, the fungus, the nematodes, all these other things that I don't even know what they are, but I know that they're important in the soil, and so they become a very, very important part of how this economy within our soil should be working. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about these little guys here. So the first principle of economics says you, you can't have an economy unless you are supplying something. You have to have something in order to sell. That's the basis of any economy. You have to make something, you have to manufacture something, you have to grow something. So within this economy, the plants, remember there's three, uh, three main characters, soil, plants, and biology, the plants are producing carbon. So this is photosynthesis, CO2 plus H2O with the energy of the sun, the chlorophyll and, and a green plant leaf, and we get C6H12O6, which is glucose, which is a very simple carbohydrate sugar, and oxygen. Oxygen is a byproduct, but it's very important to us that like to breathe. And then this right here is the basis of everything else that we're going to talk about today, everything else that's happening. C6H12O6, that very simple glucose sugar, it does not stay in this form. The plant is going to take that as the building block and it's going to change it into lots of other things. But photosynthesis is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, which some people think is a bad thing, it's a waste product, it's evil, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to 
uh, to blame lots of things on, and we won't get into that. Uh, but it's really plant food. It's what our plants need to grow. And so I know one of the speakers this afternoon is going to be talking about carbon programs. So this is something that we have to do anyway. And if we do it right, we can maybe get paid additional money to sequester this carbon. On the supply side, the soil is contributing nutrients through minerals. So if you look at this chart up here, ignore nitrogen right now because we'll talk about that later. It's not coming from the soil. But many of these other ones, potassium and phosphorus and calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, <laughs> copper, and zinc, these things plants need to grow. And guess what? They are in your soils. They're in your soils, but they're tied up and plants can't get them directly. So we'll look at how that uh, works within the system, but the soil has these minerals in there. Soil also provides a habitat for the roots to grow and for the biology to live. It's the house where everybody lives. And it also provides water storage. And Jimmy's exactly right. What he's seeing in Oklahoma, what we're seeing in Nebraska, I'm sure what your folks are seeing here too, our rainfall events are less frequent and they're more intense, okay? Who knows what's causing that? I'm not smart enough to even be part of that discussion. All I know is that it's happening and it's happening all over. And so it becomes even more important that we can store everything that we get when we get it because we don't know when we're gonna get any more. And so number one, you have to have the infiltration like what Jimmy was talking about. But number two, you've gotta have the place to store it. And, and the soil is where it's being stored. The better your soil is, the more you can store. And so that becomes very, very important, uh, especially when you're dry land farming. The biology, they're producing nutrients through fixation. We'll look in more detail about this process of nitrogen fixation. They're making nutrients available from the soil. We'll also look at that process quite a bit more. But they're also very important in the protection and the defense of our plants and within this whole economy. So the biology plays huge roles within all of this, but most of us don't even know that they're there, sometimes because they're not there because of how we farm. And, and again, we'll look at all this. Now, on the demand side, again, because in an economy, it doesn't do you any good to grow something or build something or, or produce something if nobody wants to buy it. So a true economy has to have somebody that wants to purchase, somebody that says what you have is valuable. That's called demand. Plants need nutrients from the soil. They need the water that the soil is storing, but they also need services. They need to be protected. They need to be supported. Plants can do some really incredibly amazing things, but the one thing they cannot do they can't move. They're anchored in place, and so they've had to be created with really, really sophisticated mechanisms in which they can get what they need from those around them because they are in one place, and they do really, really well at surviving even though they can't move. Uh, soil needs carbon. Jimmy's pictures were great. In fact, that one picture that he has with, with the dark soil on top and the red soil below, We've got that featured in this new resource guide that Brittany talked about, because it's just such an incredible picture of just looking at that layer of carbon, how it's moving down through that soil, it's just amazing. So soil needs carbon in order to function properly. It is not gonna work right without it, but it also needs services. And again, Jimmy's talk showed a great examples of what happens when your soil is left unprotected, when it's left uncovered. If you can see your soil, there's a good chance that it's either going to wash away or it can blow away. And so we don't want that. So the goal on our farm, like one of those first pictures I showed, I don't want to see my soil unless I go looking for it. I have to move the residue aside to go looking for it. Now, do we always accomplish that? No. You know, like Jimmy said, sometimes Mother Nature just doesn't give you the rainfall to do that, or sometimes we get out of whack our rotations. But that's our goal, is we always want to keep it covered. And then on the demand side, the biology, they have very simple needs. They need a place to live, and they need something to eat. And if you can give them those things, they'll do great things for you, and they do it really cheaply. You don't have to pay them. There's no labor issues. There's no unemployment tax. There's, there's you know, anybody that has hired people, you know that there's a lot of issues. These guys, just give them some food and give them a place to live, and they're going to work, and they're not going to complain. Kind of nice. 
In a strong economy in a thinner country, the best indicator is unemployment rate. When we have low unemployment rates, that means the vast majority of people are involved in both supplying things as well as demanding things. That makes a strong and robust economy. And it's the same thing within our soil. Our soils will be the healthiest and the strongest and the most profitable when everybody is involved. When the plants, the soils, and the animals are all producing and consuming, and diversity is very important. We don't want to have to rely just on one type of biology. Just like our economy would be very, very fragile if 100% of our economy was all within one sector. So we've got the agriculture sector, we've got manufacturing, we've got services, we've got all these different sectors, and that's what makes your economy healthy and strong because when one maybe is flagging a little bit, these others can kind of make up for it. But here's what happens. And if we're going to talk about this in terms of economics, we have to talk about welfare as well. And so what happens is when we externally provide the plant with everything it needs from the outside, particularly uh, for, you know, fertility and crop protection inputs, we weaken the economy. We break the economy. Now, we're not doing this just because it's fun to do. We're putting these things on because our plants are showing stresses. They're, they're showing signs of nutrient deficiency. They're showing signs of insect uh, and diseases. So we have to step in and put these things on in order to protect our crop and in order to grow our crop. We do it on our farm, most everybody does. Uh, so I'm not saying that we don't need these, but what we need to do is we need to try to reduce the amount of welfare, because really what that is, it's welfare payments. We're pumping extra payments into the system because now our system is broken and it's not functioning like it should. And the reason is, is because we've left the biology out of the equation. Now, I like what Abraham Lincoln says about this concept. He says, you cannot help men permanently by doing the things for them that they could and should do for themselves. I really like this because we do need to help people when they need help. Okay, I'm not saying do it yourself. We need to help people when they need help. But we're not going to help them permanently if we continue to do for them the things that they should and could do for themselves. But it's the same way with our soils. We're not going to fix our soils. We're not going to improve or grow them. We're not going to get to where Jimmy is at and be able to reclassify them if we continue to do for our soil the things that God designed the system for it to do by itself. And again, it goes back to the biology and I'm not here to tell you that we're going to, to eliminate fertility and crop protection inputs. Although I will tell you that we've listened to some really good speakers at No-Till on the Plains that they are doing that. Rick Clark, he's farming 5,000 acres, no-till organic in Indiana. The only input that he uses is seed. He does no fertilizer. <laughs> no, obviously with, uh, with uh, organic, he can't use you know, herbicides and things anyway, but he's eliminated everything else, even tillage. Now, is it all going perfectly? No. He's, he, has, he has a lot of struggles. But it is possible, but that's not the goal on our farm. I suspect it's not the goal on most of yours, but we should reduce these as much as possible. We need to get everything working the way it was created to work. And primarily, it's bringing the biology back into the system and letting them do the jobs that they're supposed to do. Okay, so the third economic principle, we have supply, demand, and currency. Currency is needed because it allows the producers and the consumers to make quick, fair, and efficient transactions. If you don't have a currency that everybody agrees on, it's very, very awkward to make transactions. So in our system, carbon is the currency that drives the whole thing. That's why this talk is called Carbonomics. That's why carbon market programs are such a hot topic right now. Carbon drives the system. Look at this. CO2 plus H2O, okay, photosynthesis, it's this carbon right here. This is the currency that drives the system. You probably grew up hearing your parents telling you, maybe you told your kids the same thing, money doesn't grow on trees, right? Well, you know what, guess what? In our system, it literally does grow on trees and corn plants and soybean plants and wheat plants. We are printing our own money and it's not causing inflation within our system like it does in, in our United States economy, but we actually have the ability to increase our currency, our cash within the system, simply by letting our plants photosynthesize more. Here's how it works. 
You got a green plant growing over here. This is a cover crop, but this could be a corn plant or soybean or whatever else. It's making carbon through photosynthesis, but only 50 to 60 percent that the carbon that a plant produces through photosynthesis is used to grow the plant. 50 to 60 percent. It's used to, to grow new roots, new stems, new leaves, to make flowers, to make seeds. The other 40 to 50 percent is not used by the plant itself. It's leaked out through the root system. And I've got a really cool picture to show you later on about that. But it's leaked out through the root system and it is consumed, it is, it is it's taken up uh, by the biology because it's their food source. And in return, the biology has to provide these services back to the plant. Because I tell you what, plants are smarter than a lot of people that I know. Because <laughs> plants, if they're making this investment, they're making these payments, uh, they're certainly smarter than our government. When they're making these payments, if they're not getting something in return, guess what? They shut it off. They don't just keep pumping carbon out into the system if they're not seeing a return on their investment. They'll say, that's enough. And so if you don't have biology in your soil in order to take advantage of what the plant is wanting to do, that plant will just simply stop putting as much carbon into the soil. And it can do that. It just photosynthesizes less. Most of our plants are not photosynthesizing at capacity. They just do what's needed. But if there's no biology in our system to take it up, they just don't do it as much. And so this is the economy. The plant's doing this. It's making a payment. These guys are accepting it. They take the contract. And they're delivering services back. It's a really simple but really effective economy. Carbon is essential to all life forms. We're 19% carbon. Uh, carbon helps these different uh, nutrients be available. Uh, it increases the availability of all of these important nutrients. It normalizes our soil pH. So if you've got high pH or low pH, it matters less when you have more carbon in your soil. So Jimmy's neighbors that have half a percent of organic matter, if they have a high pH, that's a big deal. It really makes a difference in how all things work within the soil. But if Jimmy's sending a 3% organic matter and he's got a high pH, it doesn't matter nearly as much because the carbon acts as a buffer and it makes everything work even with outside of the normal pH. It can also reduce the availability of sodium and aluminum and other things that can build up to toxic levels. And think about it as a currency. It can be collected through photosynthesis. It can be spent when it's traded to soil organisms. It can be saved through soil organic matter, which we'll talk about next. And it's desired by all members of the economy. Currency is only good if everybody accepts it, okay? Bitcoin is never gonna catch on unless everybody starts taking Bitcoin, okay? Don't try to pay me in Bitcoin. I don't understand it enough. I still take cash. <laughs> but it has to be desired by everybody within the economy to be a valid currency. It has different states. We have gaseous carbon, which is floating around in the atmosphere, CO2. We have liquid carbon, which is moving up and down through the plant and through the soil. And there's some really good articles in our resource guides from Christine Jones talking about the liquid carbon pathway. And then, of course, we have solid carbon, which is what's fixed into our body, into the body of every bacteria, every fungus, every <coughs> nematode in your soil, has solid carbon. And it can move from one state to the other very quickly. The experts tell us it can go from gas to liquid to solid in a very, very short period of time. It's a very flexible material. And then when we have excess currency, now we can have capital. So currency can go to capital when we have more of it. So when we have excess in earnings, our income exceeds our expenses, now we can start saving. And when we have excess carbon coming into the soil, above and beyond what we're sending out, we can start to store it, we can save it, we can invest it, and those investments is called soil organic matter. Jimmy talked about it a little bit. If you can only know one thing about your soil, you know, the color is great, but that color is really an indication of carbon, and carbon is measured through soil organic matter levels. And when we have more soil organic matter, things just work better. It's just gonna work better. And if you're buying a piece of property, the number one thing that I would look at on that is how, what's the soil organic matter level on it? Because that really makes a difference in how productive it's going to be. Uh, here's a slide from Dr. Jennifer Moore-Cuchera from NRCS talking about all the benefits of organic matter. 
We could spend the rest of the day talking about why organic matter levels are important. We don't have time to do that. Uh, just trust me, it's important for just everything that's going on in your soil. But when it comes to this concept, again, you can't do this. You'll never build organic matter levels in your soil unless you have more carbon coming in, more currency coming in than what you're sending out the door. Now, how do we lose carbon from our system? Well, you know, we can haul it away in a truck through corn or through soybeans that we're harvesting and, and exporting. And that's a good thing. We're getting paid for that. Uh, hay or silage, anything like that where we're removing that material, that's you know, exporting carbon from the system. We also lose it when you have residue on top of the ground, just the natural process of decomposition. You're going to lose CO2 into the atmosphere. Again, it's a natural process. There's not a lot you can do about that. Uh, certainly, anytime you lose your soil through erosion, uh, that's going to be a big you know, export, export of carbon. But one of the biggest ways that we've done it throughout the years is through tillage. Every time we till, we're introducing lots of oxygen into the system, and when you put oxygen in close proximity to carbon and you stir it all up, guess what you get? CO2. And it goes right back up into the atmosphere. And if you wonder where all the CO2 in the atmosphere came from, some of it came from you know, burning of fossil fuels, there's no doubt about that. But we have to step up and take some responsibility. A lot of it has come from our soil uh, that used to be carbon in the soil and is now floating around in the atmosphere. And so we need to put that back. The CO2 is not a problem. It's only a problem when it's not where it's supposed to be. And we need to put more of it back into our soil. So we have to get more carbon in than what we're sending out, and that's why cover crops are so very important to this system. Most cash crop rotations that are annuals, if you're doing a perennial system, completely different thing, most cash crop rotations, we don't have plants growing long enough throughout the year to put enough carbon into the system to offset what we're sending out of the system to ever grow our soil organic matter levels. And so we need to have plants growing for longer periods of time because the only way we get carbon into the soil is through plants growing. Now you can add manure and compost and things like that. That does add carbon to the soil. That's not a cash effective long term strategy. It's very expensive to do that. You can do it in short term. But for the long term, we have to get it in by growing a plant. So that's why cover crops are so important because they put carbon into the soil without exporting any carbon through a harvest process. So we move from energy, or we move from the currency and the capital to energy and resources. Because energy and resources, extremely important for an economy. You have to have something to power the system. And again, our system is powered by the sun. Uh, sun is the driving energy here. And think about this, folks. Carbon, free. Water, mostly free. You know, if you have to pay to pump out of the, you know, irrigation rights or something, you may pay something here. The energy to drive this system is free. Chlorophyll, free. Yeah, farmers should be the richest guys in the world. Well, we, we all know that it's much more complicated than this. But think about it. We're getting our energy source to drive this system for free. All we have to do is put out solar collectors to capture it and to convert solar energy into chemical energy, which we can now turn into other things, other products that we can sell. And all we have to do as farmers, it's way easier than putting these things up on the roof of your house or thousands of acres out in the desert. All we have to do is plant seeds and out pop these green leaves, which are God's perfect solar collector, and it turns that solar energy into chemical energy, which now we can do something with. So a healthy soil economy should not need significant purchased energy inputs. We know this because the soils that we farm, and we have some of the best soils in the world, you know, throughout the Midwest and the Plains, they were built from these grasslands, whether, you know, if you're down in Jimmy's area, it's more of a short grass prairie, you know, uh, over here it's more of a tall grass prairie. But thousands of years of these prairie grasses growing built these soils with no additional energy inputs other than just the energy of the sun. Now, when we farm and we export things, we're, we're hauling away corn, beans, cattle, whatever it may be, we do have to put some energy back into the system because we're removing some of it. However, it should not have to be significant. And, and when we look at our energy budget, 
when I look at the energy budget of my farm, and I suspect with any of you guys, our number one energy expense is not going to be diesel fuel. It's not going to be propane. It's not going to be natural gas. It's not going to be electricity. Our number one energy expense on the farm is nitrogen fertilizer. And let me show you why that is here. So we've talked about from the resources side, we talked about why carbon is so important. The number two thing that plants need, plants need more carbon than anything else. The second most thing that they need is nitrogen. And if you look at this pie chart here, this is a pie chart of our atmosphere. Uh, and so this little sliver right here, and this is an old slide, this is 0.03, it's closer to 0.04%. But four one hundredths of 1%, that, that's not 4%, it's not four tenths of a percent, four one hundredths of 1% of our atmosphere is CO2, okay? It gets a lot of press. It's got a really good press agent because for not being very much, you hear about it a lot. Tiny little sliver, nitrogen. 76 to 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. We pay zero dollars to get carbon into our system because it's in the atmosphere. In fact, we may get paid to take it out of the atmosphere and put it into our system. We pay billions of dollars put nitrogen into our system, even though we've got all this nitrogen. There are 30,000 tons, think about that number, 30,000 tons of nitrogen above every acre of crop ground in the world. Every acre that you farm, you've got 30,000 tons of nitrogen just sitting there, right above it. That's what's in the atmosphere above your acre of farm ground. And yet we're spending billions of dollars to put that into our system. Why is that? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is we're not dead. And the reason we're not dead is because that atmospheric nitrogen is held as dinitrogen, two nitrogen molecules, they are hooked together to each other. Very, very strong bond. It's held as N2, dinitrogen. And it is hard to break this bond. This will not react with things. So I can breathe it in and I breathe it right back out. It does nothing to my body. Which is good because if you've ever had a whiff of anhydrous or ammonia, you know what that does to your body. It can literally melt you from the inside out. Nitrogen that's not bonded as dinitrogen is very detrimental to a human body. So that's the good news. We're not dead. The bad news is plants can't do anything with it either. They're taking in that 78% nitrogen when they're bringing in the CO2 can do absolutely nothing with it. They have to just exhale it right back out. And so there's nitrogen all around them, but they can do absolutely nothing with it. So to get nitrogen into a form that the plant can use, you have to break these three bonds here. You don't just have to break one set of bonds or two sets of bonds. Three sets of covalent bonds have to be broken in order to pull that apart. And that requires a vast amount of energy to do that. So they developed in World War I and then during World War II, they really ramped it up. They developed processes to do this. A couple German scientists, Haber and Bosch, uh, created this process and it developed into these huge factories of how they could pull those nitrogen molecules apart and then they combine it with hydrogen and oxygen to make fertilizers. It was originally used to make bombs, but now it's being used to make fertilizers. There's very little difference. Uh, if you remember 27 years ago, I think, the Oklahoma City bombings, you know, how, you know, that nutcase blew up that whole entire uh, federal building. <clears throat> it was a truckload of ammonium nitrate. Uh, I was on a webinar uh, last Saturday with somebody from, um, from Libya, and uh, I had kind of forgotten the, uh, the huge explosion a few years ago over there. So it was a, one of the largest man-made explosions in history. And it was a whole bunch of ammonium nitrate sitting on a ship that they would confiscated and forgot about, and it, it blew up. Uh, and so it's very energy intensive to break that bond, but when you do, it's very reactive and hugely powerful. But here's the cool thing. What it takes man, these sophisticated factories and billions of dollars to do, God created these tiny little bacteria that do the exact same thing. Rhizobia bacteria that can colonize the roots of lagoon plants. They're doing the same thing. They're taking that N2 from the atmosphere, and they can create the right enzymes and the right chemicals. They can separate those nitrogen molecules from each other. They combine it with the hydrogen and the oxygen from the atmosphere, and they turn that into plant-available forms of nitrogen. Really cool how it does that. 
And don't ever tell people that you're growing soybeans. I don't need to fertilize them because soybeans can make their own nitrogen because they cannot. Plants can't do anything with atmospheric nitrogen. It has to be the biology doing it. Now this is an area of agriculture where we've done a pretty good job of using the biology. We inoculate our soybeans, we inoculate our alfalfa, whatever legumes we happen to be growing, we put the biology out there and let them go to work. But this is kind of where modern agriculture ends at doing a good job with promoting the biology. Because here's the thing, there are other organisms out there that can do this for non-legume plants. We have things like azosporillum and zotobacter, and they're discovering new ones all the time. These guys can do the same thing that rhizobia do. They take N2, they pull it apart, and they make it into plant available forms, and they can sell it to the highest bidder, if you will. If we think about it in terms of the economy, it's not limited to legumes. They can give this to, to grass plants, to broadleaf plants that aren't legumes, and they can provide nitrogen for them. And so the obvious answer is, well, why am I buying nitrogen? Why don't I just go dump a, a, some jugs of this stuff out there and let these guys uh, make all the nitrogen for my corn? That's a great question. Here's the answer. These things, rhizobia, incredibly powerful. If you're growing 70 bushel soybeans, it takes four to 500 pounds of nitrogen to do that. How many people would raise soybeans if you had to go put 500 pounds of nitrogen out there and do it? Nobody would. You couldn't afford it. These things are incredibly powerful. 60 days, they can produce 500 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Vast, vast amounts. And, and it's because they're forming these colonies. You know, these are huge industrial factories, if you will, uh, because there's just trillions of little bacteria and they're doing this. These guys, they're single-celled organisms. They don't form big colonies. They're not gonna have the scale of productivity. These guys will produce 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per year. Not, not in six months, per year. And so can I grow a big corn crop with just these things? No, I probably can't. But can I grow a really good corn crop with these things if I'm doing other things within my system right? Yeah, you can. And that's what Rick Clark and others are doing when they've eliminated all their fertility inputs, and yet they see their fertility numbers going up year after year because they have biology working in the system. But these things are pretty cool. Rhizobia are cool, zotobacters are pretty cool, but guess what? They can't eat nitrogen. They can produce nitrogen, they can't live on it. Their food source is carbon. And so again, this only works if the plant is willing to pay for the services of this biology by providing the carbon through its liquid root exudates in order to drive the biology. And it's not going to happen if you have excess nitrogen in your soil. And that's why you never want to have excess nitrogen after your corn crop out there because if your soybeans see 50 pounds of nitrogen that you left out in the soil after growing corn, they're going to use that first before they give the carbon payments to the rhizobia to start the nodulation process. Again, why cover crops are important, plant cereal rye, soak up all that nitrogen, make there be no excess nitrogen in the soil, let all the nitrogen be held in the rye plant, the cover crop plant, the soybeans see nothing in the soil, they go, oh, we better get to work, i gotta, I got to pay for services. They will start encouraging rhizobia to nodulate, and then when your rye breaks down later in the season, that nitrogen little boost comes back at you in, in July and August. The soybeans will still use it, and it gives you a little bit of extra yield boost from that late season fertility. Uh, so really cool how the system works when we understand it and we can take advantage of it. Now, We've talked about carbon and nitrogen, but there's all these other things that plants need to grow. You know, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, et cetera, et cetera. I told you earlier that you have these things in your soils. We just have to get them. And plants were never designed, plants were never designed to pull nutrients directly from the soil. They're very, very poor at doing that. Just like they can't get nitrogen from the atmosphere, they can't pull the nutrients from the soil Again, it has to go through the bugs. We need to get lots of little miners out there to release the nutrients from your soil to make it available for plants. I love this article from Scientific America. It says, mycorrhizae fungi run the largest mining operation in the world. It's cool because when you think about a mining operation, you think about this gigantic equipment. You know, huge trucks, payloaders, 
This is, they're saying the largest mining operation in the world is being done at a microscopic level, and you better have a good microscope if you don't want to even know what's going on. But because it's happening all around the world, it's the largest mining operation altogether. Look at this. This is a piece of feldspar. Just think of it as a tiny little grain of sand, highly magnified. And what you're seeing in here, these, these little channels or tunnels, that's actually mine shafts. Those are microscopic mine shafts. Those are hollowed out spaces. That's just air in there now because the mycorrhizae fungi have extended its hyphae. They can produce the right enzymes, the right chemicals. They actually uh, encourage the right bacterial growth that they can actually dissolve liquid rock. They turn it into liquid minerals. They bring it out in a liquid form and they bring it back to their host plant and they give it to the host plant in exchange for carbon. Because as cool as mycorrhiza are and they can liquefy solid rock, they can't eat that. That's not their food source. They're not living on that. They still have to have the carbon. Here's what it looks like. This is a plant root. Uh, highly magnified, these little black circles are what's called arbuscles. This is arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi. So they actually grow inside the plant root, so it makes it really easy to exchange the carbon. The, this, they don't even have to leak the carbon out through the root system. They can spoon feed uh, these guys within the plant root. Uh, and then these hyphae break out through the cell walls, and they go out and they explore the surrounding area. And I've got some other pictures uh, that show what this looks like in that, uh, also. So the author of this article, Jennifer Fraser, she says, oddly enough, many of our soils are rich in important nutrients, but they're locked up in a physical form that plants can't get to. And she's exactly right. If you could look at a soil test of your soils, and, and, if you, and you can request this if you want. Send it into the lab and say, I want a test of total phosphorus. All of the phosphorus in my soil. Because usually what they're going to give you is the amount of phosphorus in your soil that's available to a plant, which is a very small number. And, and the recommendation is always going to be, you need to add phosphorus. But if you were to look at the total phosphorus in your soil and then start doing the math calculations, you would find that you probably have enough phosphorus to grow crops for the next five to 10,000 years. There's that much phosphorus in our soils. And all of these other minerals as well. Your soil is made up of minerals, the parent material. You know, Jimmy's red clay, it's a nasty to work with, but guess what? It's loaded full of minerals. And if you can release them and get the carbon in there and get the biology working, it can be very, very productive. Okay. Uh, Jimmy always teases me about getting hung up on nitrogen, and I think I did. But anyway, transportation and community. So infrastructure is the next part of the economy that we want to talk about. Infrastructure are all the things that you need to make your economy grow and to function properly. The two most important infrastructures are transportation and communication. We know these are important because when you declare war on your enemy, you try to destroy them. Because when you destroy transportation and communication, you will completely disable an economy and thus a country. And you make it very easy to take them over. You make it very easy to conquer them if you can destroy transportation and communication. And so as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how does transportation work within an economy? Well, one of the reasons the United States is the strongest economy the world has ever seen is because we've got one of the best transportation uh, infrastructures ever. Now, you may not think it's so great if you get caught on a road somewhere. However, if you think our transportation infrastructure is not very good, you need to travel internationally more. <laughs> and you'll see that you maybe don't have it so bad. Uh, so this is the interstate highway system. Large roads, big conduits. We can move goods and services up and down, back and forth. Large amounts of goods and services. You know, those trucks crisscrossing the country uh, at all hours. And it's great. It's allowed us to really be effective. Now, uh, don't get me started on our logistics situation right now, but when I put this together, it was a good system at the time. Uh, but I'm down here on the Nebraska-Kansas border. I, I got 50 miles. I got to go to get up to Interstate 80, and I got about 80 miles to get down to Interstate 70. Those interstates don't do me any good if I can't get to them. I got to get to them in order to take advantage of them and be able to use them. So what really makes this effective is when we put the national highway system overlaid with the interstate system. Now there are very few people in our country that aren't close to a paved road that will get them to a better paved road, which will eventually get them to one of these big interstates. 
that will move goods and services back and forth and all around. That's what makes us a great economy. Same thing's going on in the soil. And these are pictures from uh, uh, Mycorrhizal Applications, the company that makes mycorrhizal inoculant. Uh, this is a plant with no mycorrhizal uh, colonization. This is just this plant with the roots, big roots. This is the interstate highway systems. It can move water, it can move nutrients back and forth, up and down uh, at, at very large quantities. But it can only get what it's touching. Look at all of the soil that can't get to the interstates. This is all, if I got water, if I got nutrients over here, completely wasted. Can't get there, got to get there. When I overlay, when I have mycorrhizal colonization, now this is all this hyphal network, it's spreading throughout the soil. This is not plant roots, this is the mycorrhizal hyphae, this is a fungus, but it's bringing that in. That's the highway system, it's bringing in all of these different things. Here's what it looks like under a microscope. Again, you can see the arbuscles here, this little black thing that's actually inside, part of this is inside the plant root. And then this is the hyphae growing out. Okay, this is growing out from the root. This is not part of the plant. This is part of the fungus, but it's growing out into the soil system. You can see this gooey, uh, shiny stuff here. This is glomalin. This is one of the byproducts of mycorrhiza. It's the most effective soil glue possible. It glues those aggregates together and makes your soil very stable. But these things will bring in phosphorus, which is one of the absolute hardest things to get out of your soil is phosphorus. Mycorrhiza, that's what they specialize in. They bring phosphorus to your plant. But they can also bring all these other things, potassium and calcium, magnesium, boron. And in dry times, they can even help supply water. So if you want your crops to be as drought tolerant as possible, don't worry so much about the genetics of the plant. Worry more about the biology of your system. Because when you have mycorrhiza, this is a big web pulling water in from your entire soil bank. Now, it's more than just mycorrhiza, however, that does transportation. Worms are doing this too. We've got worms bringing in water and oxygen and surface carbon and residue. If you don't have worms, earthworms in your system, you've got a long ways to go towards soil health. Don't even waste any money doing a soil health test. If you dig out there and it's uh, conditions, you know, it has to be somewhat moist and not super hot. But if you don't see worms, or at least where worms have been, see all these different holes, even if that worm wasn't there, I can see that I've got worm activity. Don't waste your money testing anything else. You've got a lot of work to do before you can even justify a test. You can see worms. You can't see the other stuff. And if you're not seeing them, you don't have very good biology. Now, communication is the other infrastructure that is super important. Because think about it. If, if, all, if mycorrhiza is bringing all these things in, how does it know what the plant wants? Because some of these things like boron, for example, plants need boron, but in very small quantities. And if the mycorrhiza were to continue to bring boron into the plant, it would actually kill the plant because it can die of boron toxicity pretty quickly. And so somehow the plant has to communicate to the biology, here's what I need and here's how much of it I need. And the plants do that by putting different carbon root exudates out here. Remember, it starts as glucose, C6H12O6. It does not stay there. It comes in the forms of carbohydrates and sugars and proteins and fats and lipids and oils. Here's that picture that I was talking about. Uh, this is one of the coolest pictures that I've ever seen. Uh, our good friend Jimmy Emmons right here took this picture number of years ago, and he took it with his iPhone with a little gadget called a ProScope attached to the camera, and so he's able to get some magnification. So this is not mycorrhiza, not magnified enough to see mycorrhiza. You'd have to have a lot more powerful microscope. This is uh, um, root hairs coming off a cereal rye plant, and look at these droplets. This is the most incredible thing right here. All of these droplets of liquid coming off of this cereal rye cover crop root that's the liquid carbon that, that that plant is pumping into the soil to feed the biology in order to get the services back that it's wanting. And each one of those drops could be something different, requesting, hey, I need phosphorus, hey, I need boron, hey, I need magnesium, I need water. Each one of those is communicating something different. Sadly, we don't have the technology yet to really do a lot of testing on what these are. And part of the reason is you never see a picture like this is because if you were to pull the cereal rye plant up, these root hairs are very fragile. They'll just slough right off as you pull that out of the ground. And if you're really super careful and you dig it up and you do a root wash and you know, you're using water to wash all that off, you can preserve and see these root hairs 
But in the process of doing that, all those little liquid droplets get washed away with the water. So the reason that Jimmy was able to get this picture is this rye, cereal rye root is growing sideways through a worm burrow, a worm channel. In fact, you can see, you can see the soil all around this. This is still the soil. This is actually growing in the space of a worm channel, a worm tunnel. And so this is actually growing in the air. There's no soil around it. And that's why we're able to capture this picture and see this. But now start thinking about the math here. Okay? This is probably an eighth of an inch at the most. Maybe a sixteenth of an inch. Oklahoma worms are a little scantier, aren't they? Maybe a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, and that's all that's exposed here because the other parts are inside the soil. But look at how many. There's hundreds of root hairs. And every one of those root hairs has five, six, seven droplets of carbon coming out of it. And if we have a sixteenth of an inch, every rye plant probably has 30 to 50 yards of root system. And there's a million rye plants per acre. Start doing the math of how many liquid carbon droplets that is. And this is just a snapshot in time. This thing is going to be growing for 90 to 100 days. Jimmy, this was what, 8, 10, 12 inches tall? This was not mature rye. This is a growing cover crop. Start thinking about how much carbon can be put into the system. And if these guys selling carbon credits want to talk about carbon sequestration, this is where it's happening. It's not happening by growing 20 tons of dry matter and leaving it on top of the ground. Most of that's going back to the atmosphere. This is where carbon sequestration is happening right here. All right, plants communicate other ways as well. I need to kind of finish up here pretty quickly, so I'm going to go through this really fast. Plants can communicate through volatile organic compounds. Uh, basically, they can sense and smell each other. In this new Soil Health Resource Guide, there's a four-page article in there from Nicole Masters. Nicole is one of the top soil microbiologists in the world, and she's got a great example of this happening in Africa in an experiment that they did of how trees talk to each other when they're being grazed by giraffes. We don't have a lot of experience with giraffe grazing here, so we'll take the word for it. But it's an example of how plants can communicate with each other. They're very, very sophisticated communicators. An article in the Scientist magazine a number of years ago talking about how plants communicate not only with each other, but they can communicate with the insects. It can actually call in an airstrike. If you get aphids attacking your plant, it will try to signal insects saying, come over here, I have aphids, please eat them. And they will do that. But guess what? If you have no ladybugs or lacewings or wasps that eat aphids around, they're going to be making that signal to nobody. Nobody comes in and helps. But if you have the insects, if you're farming in such a way that you have insect habitat around your borders or you have an insectary strip or something, then these guys can come in and they can, they can increase their populations as well and they can help. Plants also communicate through the root systems, through mycorrhiza. Again, it's a whole fascinating area that we just don't have time to talk about. So a plant, the last thing is defense and protection. We need to be protected from all these things because, you know, we need water. But when we have too much of it or too little of it, as Jimmy showed pictures, it's a bad thing. We have heat, cold, <coughs> compaction, weeds, insects, diseases. We have lots of things that want to attack our, our, our economy. And so the first thing that we need to do is just keep the soil covered. In my opinion, this is the most important of the soil health principles. Everybody has a little bit different. They're all important. I put this one first simply because if we don't keep the soil covered, everything else that we do isn't going to matter if your soil washes away or blows away. So we have to keep it covered. That's number one. Number two, there's, there's a lot of defense and protection coming from plants signaling and communicating with each other. Just one quick experiment to talk to you about. Uh, this is by the students at the University of Delaware. This is a rockcress plant. They infected it with a pathogen called Pseudomonas syringae. It turns the leaves yellow, brown, and they fall off and the plant dies. They take the same type of plant in a pot, put it here. They infected it with the same pathogen, Pseudomonas syringae. It's in there, but it shows no signs of any attack or any effect because they also inoculated the soil with this beneficial bacteria called Bacillus subtilis. So when the plant notices that it's under attack by Pseudomonas syringae, it activates its defense mechanisms. It starts pumping out lots of carbon root exudates. I don't know what they are, but it's a way to communicate, I'm under attack and I need help, and I've got all the food that you want if you'll come protect me. Bacillus subtilis gets the message. 
blows up their populations. That's what bacteria can do. They can exponentially increase their populations. And this picture is a magnified root from this plant right here. And what you see, they colored it green so you can see it. But this is trillions of Bacillus subtilis bacteria that are actually filming a physical biofilm barrier around that plant root. Pseudomonas syringae cannot get through that, and that plant is growing perfectly healthy, even though there's a pathogen in that pot. And that's what happens in nature, in natural systems. The good biology outnumbers the bad, and when you have the proper balance, you rarely see disease-type issues in, in native natural systems. A third line of defense is having healthy plants that produce complex compounds which give natural resistances. This is a super complicated topic in a slide. There is a whole page article in the resource guide that you got in your folders in here from John Kemp. John Kemp's probably the smartest guy that I've ever heard. Eighth grade education, an Amish man. He's read every book probably ever written on soil health and remembers every single word. I'm convinced of it. The dude is just really, really smart, and he comes up, you know, he, and, and he's able to communicate it in a way that I can understand. So very, very impressive. Look at this article in your book. It will explain more what's going on there. There's symbiotic relationships with other types of funguses, not mycorrhiza. Uh, this is endophyte fungus with some research that Noble Research was doing. And then the last, just be diverse. Get as much diversity into your system as you can, because if you're just growing one or two things and that's all you're doing, uh, the diseases and the pests are going to find a way uh, to get to you. So that's the keys to a healthy soil system. I know I'm a little bit over time. Uh, I just need two minutes to go through my closing points here. Economies are intricately interconnected and interdependent. If you mess with one part of the system, it messes with everything. And when we take the biology out of the system, we don't purposely take biology out of the system, but the way that we farm has taken it out. And so when that's gone, then we have to step in with all the welfare payments. So number two, we need to reduce the amount of welfare that we're giving our system if we want to be profitable. Reduce it by getting everyone working the way that they were created to work. Particularly get the biology back into your system. They'll do great things for you. Number three, increase your cash flow. Your banker is always harping on you about cash flow. Well, tell them you're going to double your cash flow this year because you're planting a cover crop. You don't have to tell them that the cash flow is of carbon because when you're only planting corn and soybeans, you are less than 50% efficient at capturing solar energy and turning it into liquid carbon energy that you can pump into your soil and feed your biology. So you need to get cover crops. You need to, if you can get livestock integrated, that's even better. Fill these gaps when there's nothing growing and you have sunlight hitting bare soil. That increases your cash flow, and then when you do that, you can turn that extra cash flow into investments, long-term investments. You will start to grow your soil organic matter, especially properly integrated livestock can help that process as well. But you will start to make these investments, and when you do that, it is silly, it's foolish, it's stupid to make a long-term investment and then do this, where you're selling off the investments that you just did. So don't do any unnecessary tillage. Don't be doing this unnecessary residue removal because that's selling off the investments that you just worked so hard to make. Number five, take advantage of the free tiny workers. Get this biological diversity into your system. They do all of these great things very, very cheaply and very, very effectively. Uh, number six, build and dis don't destroy your infrastructure. You know, get mycorrhiza. Encourage earthworm growth. Farm in such a way that encourages these things you'll really see it grow. And then again, don't come in and do this because this is an act of war. When you are doing tillage, you're literally declaring war on your soil because you're destroying the infrastructure. And that's what happens in wartime. Number seven, protect your economy of soil armor. Again, do what it takes to keep the soil covered at all times, or at least strive to because that's super important in, in protecting everything. And then number eight, again, diversity is so very important and keeping this going. Get as much diversity into your system. If you can't get it in by growing six, seven, eight cash crops like Jimmy and Russ are doing back there, get the diversity into your system through cover crops because now in a single planting you can introduce six, seven, eight different species into your system without having to harvest them all. So that's carbonomics. That's what's going on in the soil. It has a really good mirror to what's going on in our economy, and I hope that helps you understand it from a big picture perspective. Again, some of the next speakers, my talk, Russ's talk, we'll get into how we see this working out in the field as well. So 
Thank you very much. Sorry I went over a little overtime.